Yeah, Ian, right. Now, as you say, you, you have you know quite a lot of interaction with him now. So do you ever remind him that the first ever match he was playing and they got Gub 3-1? <laughs> I think I don't think I have mentioned that to him, funnily enough. Oh, well, uh, I think you should. I think it, it, yeah, I, I probably should. I'd probably also mention, <laughs> he'll say, I'll say, I saw, saw you lose to um, QPR, and he'll say, which one, <laughs> which game? <laughs> yeah, true. Because the reverse, yeah. John Jensen scored his one yeah. and only Arsenal goal, which was a cracker, and it was a 3-1 defeat at Highbury as well. So it, it, it's amazing to think, you know, heady days for QPR, but... Um, but like we said before, Arsenal were in that weird zone. You know, this is just before Wenger and the tail end of George Graham. And George Graham had brought great success playing a style. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, I work with Alan Smith a lot. He was actually in that Arsenal squad that season. Uh, yeah. Didn't play in that game, but he was in that squad. Um, and, you know, that was his last season at Arsenal. It just felt there was a changing of the guard. I think Stefan Schwartz was playing for us one and only yeah. season. One of those, do you remember him, people? Yeah, it, it's just, again, we it, I, we know this as football fans, that just naming random players <laughs> from a particular <laughs> time is a great pleasure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you're on the quiz team there. They're going, come on, let's get Seb up. He knows all the obscure players. <laughs> yeah. Not so much the other stuff. Um, it's actually looking through the lineups, Glenn Helder. Mm. It's pretty much it. They've got Stefan Schwartz here, but he's not actually in the program, so I'm not sure if he played. But I don't think he's done it. Don't know. Glenn him. Helder definitely played, and from what I can see, he is the only non-British player in the whole well, twenty-two. Sure yeah, I'm trying to think. That's a very good point. I get, and just I think what Wenger would bring not long after that. Well, exactly. And and as you say, yeah, I mean, if, um, if Schwartz, I think if Schwartz played, then he he would be obviously another one to add to that. Yeah, but I'm trying to think if there's any Irish players. Uh, yeah, I mean, okay, again, going off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, no, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, that would that would probably make sense at the time. So um, Alan, Alan McDonald was he Irish? Oh, you're talking about for either side. You're talking about for either side. Either side. That's a very, yeah. Oh, that's a very good point. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I'd have to check. I'd have to check. Yeah, I'd have to check. But but so, it wasn't. That's but that goes back to what I was saying. They they were few and far between at that point in time. If that that season probably brought another group into the league, and I think the '94 World Cup brought a few players into the Premier League. Again, that was a lot of a, that was a scouting mission. Often the tournaments you'd see players arrive. So for the from the Premier League's point of view, obviously Euro '92. And and World Cup ninety four, a lot of players who stood out in that tournament ended up in the Premier League, um, to varying degrees of success. Uh, obviously, Jensen was one of those. Um, you know, the Thomas Brolins, etc. In pull all these people. Don't mention Thomas Brolin, please. <laughs> that, I didn't want to say. <laughs> I was on my honeymoon. Oh, here, here you go. I was on my honeymoon in Italy, and I persuaded my wife, who is Scottish, that. I needed to watch the England Sweden game. So off I went to a local bar in Italy. And guess who was sitting? The only other person sitting in the bar was a German. And he said, You'll win this game. Don't worry about it. And, you know, we went 1 0 up. I said, And you listened to him. I said, Here you go. You, you, you'll be fine. When Brolin scored, I turned around and he'd left. And I think that was probably a very wise decision because. I was going to absolutely rip him apart. Say, I told you we weren't going to win this one. Um, but but that so so just say on that point. I mean, I'd have to check through the teams again. But obviously, if Schwartz played and if Helder played, they would be the only two foreign players. Because yeah. even thinking of the Irish players, they would be Northern Irish players. Like Steve Morrow yeah, so. um, and Alan McDonald, I think, was Northern Irish. Pretty sure. Yeah, that's what so I think. yeah yeah. So yeah, I mean, but again, being a being in the crowd. You're not really thinking of these things. You are not no. thinking these things at all. You just you're just watching the game, um, and that's it. And the excitement, as you say, because QPR win, you're basically as you're half an hour from the ground, so you've got a connection with this club, uh, and they train at your school. I mean, you know, later on. So th- this is what I think a lot of people love about football. 
is that immediate connection. It gets you. And then, okay, some people move on and they go to another club or some people stick with the club that they've started with. Some of us, unfortunately, have had to go through the, the you know, <laughs> the ups and downs, let's call it, of, of being that, that supporter. But it's always that first game that grabs you and then you can relate to it later on, say, oh, this and that. And, and I think you're absolutely right as well, going back to a point you made earlier about the kits. So QPR's kit, blue and white hoops, don't get many hoops in English football. So that stands out. You've then got the red and white, but a different, you know, the red with the white sleeves of Arsenal. And I think the great thing is, they haven't really changed, have they? I mean, you obviously got. They, they arm feel they feel and... slicker now. They feel slicker now. They do. They? It felt quite blocky. Our Arsenal's kit then yeah. felt quite blocky, and I think the JVC, if that was the sponsor, I'm not going to get into sponsor debates. <laughs> <laughs> Again, quite a blocky logo, uh, but kits did feel very clean. Also, numbers on the back of players' shirts were very clean and clear. Nowadays, it's not the case. Some teams, you know, think of Sheffield United the other day. I was not. Uh, recognizing players based off their shirt numbers, you you just don't bother. Um, yeah, it's you know it's not clear enough. Newcastle the same, West Brom, um, it's the similar situation. But what did what I do? Another memory from that game were I do feel like there were a lot more people wearing the shirts in the ground. There was a very mm-hmm. blue and white feel to the lot of the crowd, and red and white to the away end. Uh, it was a strong, maybe some yellow in there as well, obviously, for Arsenal. But it was a very, very strong sense of colour again to what I was to what I was saying. And to go back on a point you were saying earlier about QPR and the catchment area. When I was at school, there were such a mix of clubs being supported. There were a lot, probably the biggest supported club were Manchester United because mm-hmm. they were successful. And obviously being in London and going to school in London, there were a lot of uh, kids in in my years whose parents either weren't born in England or had no interest in football. And so they were choosing their teams on the fly, essentially. And there were people in my... There was a guy in my class who supported Argentina. There was Barcelona supporters randomly. Um, Not a lot of Italy, actually, strangely, considering they had the strong, really strong teams at the time. Um, there were QPR supporters. There was a growing number of Fulham fans because they were working their way up the divisions. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm trying to think now. Who else? I don't think I'm, I didn't meet a single Brentford supporter the entire time at school. Uh, and not actually, when I think back, I can't think of any Chelsea's fans, which seems crazy as well, considering where you are being in West London at that time. Uh, a few Arsenal fans, a few Tottenham fans. But but no no Palace fans I'm afraid I think West West London's a stretch. <laughs> well you know we, we're trying but you know yeah I mean ours, ours is a global fan base so we don't mm. need to worry about West London. Uh, sure. <laughs> yeah so going back to um, that game as well did you have any other sporting events that you've been to which you could compare with and and I love the idea of you walking basically from Labour Grove to, to Loftus Road, which, as you say, is about half an hour. You know, that feeling of the shirts, you know, people do did wear shirts. So the closer you got to the ground, the more shirts you see and the more people. But was there anything else that you... Did you go to a rugby match? Did you go to a cricket match where you say, oh, this is actually completely different? Yeah, I, I do remember. I mean, I liked, you know, I still do like my cricket, international cricket. I remember being taken to a game. and But I, but this is the thing. It was so around that time, I couldn't tell you who was playing. I could not tell you who was playing. I couldn't tell you if it was Lords or the Oval or anything. Because, and I think a big part of that is is that atmosphere. Like, to me, in my mind, and, you know, it's originalist a bit because I work in football principally, so... I know what Loftus Road looked like, you know, and everything else. But that strong connection of people being in shirts, uh, a lot of, there were a lot of, actually, I'm trying to remember the sort of age of the crowd. 
I mean, it, it, it's quite a mix. I do, I do remember. Obviously, mostly men, and they're all in these kits. There's a lot of shouting, just random noises. You know, just a football noise. <laughs> it's just a football noise. You don't get it anywhere else. It's just, yeah. it's just a general really, um, which I never get. And everybody feels like everybody's putting on an accent to sing a song or whatever it is. It's just a certain <laughs> way you have to do this stuff. Yeah. sticks with me whereas the cricket memory i don't remember it. it just all felt very quiet and and the only slight memories i remember and i i again i wasn't sh i'm not sure what player it was but they were definitely uh remember the time it might have been it was a prominent player who came over to sign lots of autographs and they signed i had a bat with me i don't know why I don't know where that bat <laughs> is or what happened to it but there was a bat and they signed it. And I really wish I knew who that player was. I want, you know, I wish it was like, why well, is a Macrim or something? <laughs> then I could say yeah. that was an amazing moment. But I can't, I can't remember. Didn't go into any rugby because being in London, there wasn't any. Um, I think Wasp started playing at Loftus Road, but that was, uh, that was a bit later. And I saw them play a couple of times because the school had a, had a relationship. There, as I say, there were a few QPR fans in the school, but, I don't. I don't know if the school had a had a relationship with the club at all. There should have been. I think there really should mm. have been. The club, and I don't think clubs need to make more of that. Especially clubs who may be fighting for support should be making a concerted effort to go into the schools and tell you know make a connection with the community that they should definitely be doing. Especially when they have right. You know, QPR are a perfect example. I think. I know they're not there anymore, but. Um, that I didn't remember ever thinking that was a, a sort of scenario. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's I don't think other sports had that really. The closest you could come is boxing, in terms of feeling a real. And I don't use the word visceral, I guess, but a real like the crowd had an effect on you as much as what was going on in the sphere of the sport itself. Uh, that's as close as you can get, really. From sport. as people might say, darts has matched that now. <laughs> I think most people. I think most people the darts are just having a good time. To be honest, yeah, it seems that it's it's carried along by a fair amount of drinking, doesn't it? But uh, maybe I'll get Luke Littler on this podcast because I know he's a big football fan, and we we can chat through his first game, which let's face it, wasn't that far ago, long ago. I was going to say last season. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially. Um, you, you, I agree with you about cricket. I've been to you know a fair amount of cricket and it's a, just a completely different atmosphere because it's quite reverential. You know, people chat, you know, they've got their bottles of wine for the whole day. But, but you never feel, well, I don't really feel a cricket crowd influences the game very much. Whereas football... You definitely get that feeling, you know, let's face it, home generally is stronger than the way. But then again, you get away fans and, you know, good away following can always lead to, uh, you know, a response from the team. So I think the connection between the fans, the players and in a way what's going on on the pitch is much, much closer in football than, than any other, certainly, team sport um, that I can think of. So, you know, that that's something that football has absolutely got as a unique attribute. Um, again, going back to something you said earlier about consuming a lot on television and obviously free-to-air because you didn't have the opportunities to get Sky, um, in those early days, can you remember your first FA Cup final? Because I was looking again, when you look at the context of your QPR Arsenal game, Everton won the FA Cup. Everton, you know, coming around everyone. That's the last trophy they won. And, yeah. you know, know. And they don't look like they're going to win another one that soon. Sorry, Everton fans. But um, can you remember your first one watching it on telly? So again, with that one, I wasn't emotionally invested in that final, but I do remember Paul Rideout because I had one mm -hmm. of his big head football figures, <laughs> and We're I remember back. my sis. And I remember I had one of them. My sister tried to claim that she was an Everton fan because of this football figure. She just quite liked it, and that was it. And you know, it's a load of rubbish, obviously. Um, but I don't. Again, 
it's these moments in time. You're in that moment and you're thinking, are Everton a big club? You know, this is how you know how you view it. You're I always remember thinking of Leeds being really good at the time, and and the perceptions changed really quickly. Like you're saying about QPR, you know, very soon QPR were not one of the top teams, or even you know, even in the league, things change. I remember certain teams feeling like they were a fixture, and then suddenly they weren't. You know, Coventry City, Sheffield Wednesday, Nottingham Forest, everything else, and and thing can change really quickly in football. I would say the FA Cup final that I was, when I was really invested in it, watching all of the build up and everything was the white suits final was the Manchester United Liverpool final, the Cantona yeah. goal. Um, and I do remember those suits that they do just, these things just stick out because you're watching yeah. the entire build up and thinking, I've never seen anybody wear a suit like that, let alone a whole football team. I do remember Manchester United felt like a bit of a machine and like I said, lots of kids in the schools I went to were supporting them because they were the best team of the time. Blackburn didn't quite make that trans- transition down south, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately for them. No. Um, but it felt like if anybody could beat Manchester United, then they'll win something. And I think the League Cup final, um, and I'm probably getting my League Cup finals mixed up when I think about it, because I think it's probably 96 that I paid more attention to that competition. Remember, dramatic semi final. It felt like the time Arsenal playing Aston Villa. I think Arsenal were 2 0 up. Then Dwight York scored twice. Then Villa got to the final, played Leeds. Um, and again, Villa, Aston Villa felt like a big team at the time as well. They felt like one of the top teams. And I had their entire squad as big head football figures as well. So I could remember, being, you know, I could rattle through their entire team. Um, but yes, the FA Cup Final 96, I'd say, was the one where I really, you know, watched every single second of the build-up, got really involved in it. And I said that summer just ran really nicely because it ran into the Euros. Uh, I remember, again, I remember weirdly in Europe, I was supporting the English clubs in Europe. And that season, I want to say that Forrest played Bayern and got spanked. Wow. <laughs> sounds familiar, yeah. Yeah, it sounds... Really, and uh, but I remember again being in awe of the Bayern team. I think Klinsman had gone, he'd been at Spurs, gone to Bayern, trying to get the timeline right. And I'm going off pure nostalgia around this period rather than being a geeky commentator. But just the feeling at the time was, you know, that these teams are so much better. So come the Euros, I had absolutely no. I in my expectation, I thought, oh, Italy are going to be really good, Spain are going to be really good, and but Germany, they're going to be the real big team to beat and I remembered the Bulgarian team and um, thinking oh they might do something and I didn't have high hopes for England at the time because they hadn't qualified for the previous tournament so <laughs> what can you say well yeah the, the I think the expectations for England have completely changed and, and for the better but um, that would be a, another podcast I think mm. um, I'd like to just Couple of last things, Seb. Um, what about your first games as a commentator? So, uh, you know, you, you say you switch from being a producer to a commentator, then you worked for a while for BT Sport and obviously you're now at Sky. So, what can you remember about your first commentated games? So, again, I've, I've been in this position before is that I can't remember my first commentary game in in the capacity of being paid to do a commentary i i can't remember and the reason why is because i was a producer and doing some commentary at the same time and i just felt like a tv professional and just doing what i needed to do and and it's re- it, people can't believe that i can't remember it um which is really bad uh and this is not some weird dodge so people can't try and find it it's not that at all it's that i genuinely cannot remember my first game as such i remember my first game for bt sport at the time was uh and i'm saying i remember it was a bundesliga game uh hamburg were playing and i cannot remember who they were playing that's that's how bad yeah. it is but i think it's because i was yeah it's a fantastic memory but i the reason why and i, I suppose the best way of saying it is because at the time i was doing several different jobs in TV, television. 
and working on big competitions already. So doing the commentary was just part of that process. It wasn't somebody trying to get into telly or trying to be a commentator and then getting their chance. And then mm -hmm. they say, oh, this is my first, you know, where people were announced, this is my first game today. What a big occasion was. It wasn't like that for me. It was almost like, I always wanted to be a commentator as well, which is another add-on point. It wasn't just suddenly out of the blue. I was building to it and I would be just doing bits here and there randomly. So rather than just sticking on a game that I did, I would, you know, do voiceovers, you know, round football roundups um, alongside my other producing roles. And these would be producing at games, doing the replays for goals, directing things, being floor manager, all these rare, various jobs in television. Which is another thing I always say to people that there are a lot more jobs in television than they realise. And I just I just don't know. But what I do remember weirdly is one is my first commentary game <laughs> when I was a kid practicing right. with the big head football figures. They're back. These Corinthian <laughs> Yeah, they're back again. And I was I was uh, <laughs> recreating Coventry City against Leeds United. And David Burrows scored the winning goal in a 1-0 win for Coventry City. Okay. And the reason why I remember that is because I recorded it and I had it on tape for a long time. And I, I that tape is somewhere. That tape is somewhere. But as I said before, we need to be dig that out. So, yeah. <laughs> I need to find that <clears throat> and burn it, I'm sure. But yeah, it's a, it's a, that, that I won't forget. And I actually, because we've been moving recently and everything else, I found... Um, I found a lot of them. In fact, unfortunately, I've got one on the desk here that I just dug out in a bag. Cause, and uh, it's, uh, if you can see this, try and guess who this is, if I can. I'm going to raise them in front of the camera. Ooh, um, There's crikey. nothing to help you. Yeah. Is it a Sunderland player? Nope. Sheffield United. Maybe the tash might help. The moustache might help. It works it's amazing. Just, his head's podcast. so big, it's it's quite <laughs> tricky. Give me give me the team and then I'll try and Southampton. Crikey. <laughs> Still don't get it. Sorry. I'm not very yeah. good at puppetry. Well, I'll I'll tell you it's Francis it's Francis Benali. Francis Benali. But, oh. but the shame for him is his legs are missing. And I don't know when <laughs> they disappeared or when they broke <laughs> off, at what point. In, in yeah. my football journey, he lost his legs, but he's the only player, I think, who has no legs. Um, okay. Yes. I remember that yes. with Sabutio. I... Sabutio, it used to happen. You know, he used to lose the top of it, and so he actually just had stumps left. And I always thought they were a bit quicker because they were a little bit nippier. But, um, Is that cheating? Yeah. Is that cheating? Yeah. yeah, potentially. I mean, flicking, you know, another issue in Sabutio, but we're, we're not going to go into that. Um yeah, well, I'd, I'd love to see your full Corinthian set at some stage, so, so, so yeah, <laughs> I'll pop round one day. A um, yeah. couple of last things um, about taking someone to their first game. I, you did allude to it earlier, so I believe it was your daughter you took to a game, so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so last, the back end of last year... Um... I took my daughter to the Women's Champions League semi-final between Arsenal and Wolfsburg at the Emirates. I just take her to a big ground, you know, a stadium, big crowd, but they're yeah, nicer seats, you know, considering who mm. I work for. <laughs> and because I thought to myself, even though she's not into football, I think giving children an experience of any event like that is great. You know, she went to see the Lion King, for example. And when you, if you get taken, the privilege of a child to be taken to these things, I think it's just so special. You know, she won't forget that day, even if she doesn't ever have a love of football. She still talks about it, but she's so privileged in the fact that she got to sit next to Haley Rasso, Australian international, Izzy Christensen, England international. You know, these are sort of privileges that I was nowhere near as a child. Let's put it that yeah. way. Um, but I just felt that it's it's how you know. Let's let's be honest, and that's you know me talking selfishly as a father. I was hoping that she'd get the bug just being there and thinking, mm -hmm. oh yeah, I'd, yeah, I want to get into this sport. This is great. Not sure that happened. Um, unfortunately, I'm not sure yet. 
but who knows? She's still got time. She's only young. She has. And, of course, there's a link here because I think Wolfsburg, didn't they win? Very late winner. Uh, yes. A bit like Naeem in the Cup Winners' Cup for Arsenal. So Arsenal, yeah, last-minute <laughs> winners. Yeah, you know, yeah. It happens, guys. Matches. Yeah. Um, one other thing from the programme, which I do have to raise with you, and I'm sure will be of interest to you. So... The, the profile player is Trevor Sinclair, who you mentioned before, mm. okay? And they have the classic questions, you know, what do you hate most about football? This question, it, I mean, I couldn't quite believe the answer. I'm sure it had been edited. So the question is, what would you change in football? And this is Trevor Sinclair's answer. If there is time, take a quick look at a video replay to see if the ref was correct on a decision. Trevor Sinclair thought about VAR before it was even conceived. How about that? He's a I visionary. Mean, this, I mean, this is a man who scored one of the greatest goals of all time as an overhead kick, uh, yeah. if not the greatest overhead kick I've ever seen on telly. Yes. <laughs> uh, and part of that England squad in 2002, out of nowhere, relatively. You know, so I listened to... Trevor's words from those days he he was obviously looking ahead and knowing what was to come and it's mm -hmm. amazing because now there's probably a lot of people who prefer if it never came <laughs> at all well but yet yeah. but yet last night QPR had a had a decision which VAR certainly would have overturned with a handball mm. so yeah it's just the way football is I think football is is an emotional sport whatever whatever the officials try to do someone will complain about it I'm sure yeah, and we're not getting into a debate about VAR because, you know, it's, it's almost Christmas, so we're, we're not going to do that. Um, brilliant. So thank you very much. If there's anything else you want to throw in, so I know you said you had a four-year gap for your next game and whether you would ever admit to supporting a team, I don't know. But um, is, what was the one thing that struck you about that first game and when... What did it then lead to, basically? I, You know, it's sort of saying what I was saying earlier. I think it's just a sensation, a tactile sensation of being around mostly older blokes shouting and screaming at guys running around on a pitch kicking it <laughs> from one side to the other. And people, everybody is invested in it in that experience that's what's also interesting there wasn't anybody who was checking their phone because that you know people didn't have phones in their hands in those days they weren't i'm trying to think now maybe someone would have a newspaper tucked under their arm or something like that but everybody was their eyes were on the game and everything that was happening and this is just one match amongst many in a football season for two teams who ultimately are in the if you could say middle third of the table or yeah. whatever you know but it felt on that day the most important thing in the world and every single moment of it. And even half time, it felt like the noise never ended. There was always a, a, a bubbling of all, of a noise as a soundtrack to the game at all times. Half time, walking up to the game, after the game. And it's a pattern. It's a fat pattern that doesn't matter what match you go to. You feel like that pattern is the same everywhere. That feeling, that anticipation before the game, people are chatting. I think obviously what's changed it now is the presence of mobile phones in the ground. So half the people, some people have got their heads down, some people are taking photos and videos and stuff. But then they, that, that distraction was not there. And uh, and as everybody always says, they always think the world was better when they were younger or whatever it is. But I think what I would say to that time, everything felt a lot simpler. Uh, the players felt a lot closer to the fans. It felt like times because like I said where I was at the ground it felt like you could just anyone just shout across to a player and they just wink back to you and you know you'd have a moment of communication but it also felt like you could and I know this sounds mad but just sort of walk down walk along the pitch and just go down the tunnel and chat to people it just that's what it felt like at the time it just felt really open um I, I'm sure it wasn't I'm sure if I ran on the pitch I would have been tackled but it it did feel everything felt very very simple. Um, I'm not saying better. I'm just saying simple. Yeah. Well, some people would say simplicity is beauty. Um, so yeah, I think uh, 
pretty much at the end here, Seb. So really appreciate your time. I know, um, you know, you've got commentaries coming out of your ears. So mm-hmm. it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, as I say, if you wanted to ever, you know, declare who you support, that would be, you know, something that we could keep between ourselves or we could share with other people. Um, I'll, I'll say a point on that, actually. Yeah. I'll say a point on that. It's it's like, I think for commentators and our role in, in our job, it feels like I don't want to give people that distraction when they're listening to the game. Um, obviously, for a former player, it's different because their career connection is out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's funny, actually, because a lot of fans probably don't know what teams a lot of footballers support, weirdly. They just connect the clubs they played for and assume that they they support them. That's not yeah. always the case. That's the thing. Um, mm-hmm. But I always think as my role as a commentator, it does not matter who I support. And that's why I just leave it at that. Uh, and in my, you know, in, in my working life, everyone knows, you know, team, team you follow and stuff. But in this sort of scenario, of, 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 of not the scenario, but the job that you do, it is an irrelevance to the to the coverage of the game. I think the role of a commentator is just to add, and you know, it's so subjective. Some people hate a commentator. Some people love a commentator. Whatever it is. But you're just adding a bit more flavour to the game. You're, you're you're just bringing the importance of the game to the fore if you can. And it goes back to when I was growing up and what made me fall in love with commentary in general is that you are a narrator to what's going on. You know, if you look at any Nature Pro, Natural History programme with David Attenborough over the, the top of it, you could take his voice away and still see what the animals are up to and it would still be amazing. But then having yeah. that narration over the top just adds something to it. And that's the aim as a commentator. And I don't want to be doing, you know, my next game is uh, Arsenal Brentford, uh, is the, you know, in the Premier League. If I'm coming into that game and people are saying, "Oh, Seb's an Arsenal supporter," um, it changes the game for Brentford supporters yeah. watching, for Manchester City supporters watching, Liverpool yeah. fans watching. It 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 changes everything for them because it's like, oh god, you know. Whereas I prefer it as it is now, which. <laughs> Which is people thinking you're against their team all the time or for yeah. their team all the time. I love that because I, you know, people coming up to me and say, oh, "I'm sure you're a Forest fan because you love Forest," or "I'm sure you're an Everton supporter. You're right behind them," and all this sort of stuff. Oh, you hate Newcastle United, whatever it might be. And mm-hmm. um, and I, I I I like it that way. Um, when when these things do come out and they always do come out eventually, again, it's not really a problem. But I prefer it this way because it's it just thinks you go into a game and just. Give it your all and and just leave it at that. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I get that. And, and as I've said before, we you know, I interviewed Martin Tyler a while ago, and he's been accused, I think, of being a fan of nearly every club he's ever commentated yeah. on. And he I've hates got Liverpool issue. apparently. Yeah, he hates yeah, Liverpool yeah. apparently. Is that hates right? Liverpool, yeah. hates Man United, <laughs> hates Man City, <laughs> hates, Man City <laughs> hates Chelsea. <laughs> but I've got news for you, kids. He's a Woking fan, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. That's not going to affect. His commentary uh, didn't in the past, and um, he's still doing it uh, for other channels now, well, I mean, so what, it won't in the future. What, I mean, what I will say is, because I've lived in various places, and I've always got a little connection with the clubs in the areas I've moved to. Um, and so, little soft spots for Leighton Orient, Queen's Park Rangers, which are before Luton Town, Peterborough United, Stoke City, bizarrely. Don't ask me about that, but that yeah, <laughs> don't ask me that, they're part of it. Um and you you do have that, you do get that. If a, if a club is near where you live, and I feel like that should be part of it, I think it's, it's different. London can be a bit different in that regard. But I think if you move to a town or anything else, having a connection with the team in the town that you live in, I think is a healthy thing. I think it's quite good um, because it just adds to your interest in football as well, especially if they're a lower league team because it's a completely different experience to the Premier League, of course, it is in terms of expectation and <laughs> most of the, most of the weeks is your team even going to win a game. Um, but the, the root of it is still going back to what I was saying, being in that stadium in, in, in Loftus road for my first match and that universal <laughs> that carries across all levels of English football. Let's put it that way. <laughs> oh, I think that's a great place to end. Is is going to stay with me? It'll become my earworm over the next couple of days. So, Seb Hutchinson, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much for your time, and 
<coughs> See you again soon, hopefully.